Uh, welcome everybody to this Euro NMD plus Euro uh, R&D for Air Neurological Diseases and European Academy of Neurology joint webinar. Uh, as you know, during our webinars, people are muted, but can use the chat and the question and answer tool to put questions or to dialogue amongst them. Uh, at the end, uh, people will be unmuted to voice the questions if they choose to. Uh, today, we have uh, two investigators uh, from the Myology Research Center uh, at INSERM, Institute of Myology and Sorbonne University, that I'm going to present uh, next. So, Mario Gomes Pereira, um, that uh, you see in a white shirt here, uh, has been working in myotonic dystrophy uh, for uh, type 1 and uh, as a formation uh, in that area that comes from a long time ago. Uh, he, he has been working in a nucleotide extension disorders, repeat disorders for more than 20 years. And he studied at the University of Porto in Portugal, where he debuted his research career as an investigator of uh, transteratine variants associated with familial uh, uh, myelodiotic uh, polyneuropathies. Then he obtained his PhD from the University of Glasgow, where he studied, studied the molecular mechanisms of trinucleotide repeat expansion in human disease. Currently, he conducts his research in the Myology Research Center, and uh, that is a renowned institution of international recognition in the field of neuromuscular diseases. Uh, where he integrates the lab laboratory repeat expansions and myotonic dystrophies that are, uh, is led by Denis Fouling and Geneviève Boudreau. Uh, the team combines unique scientific and clinical expertise in a combined effort to promote translational research uh, from the study of upstream genetic events to downstream pathophysiological consequences and ultimately to the development of new therapeutic tools. In this multi-layer team, Mario Gomes Pereira leads the CNS dysfunction in dystroph uh, myotonic dystrophy type, type 1 that focuses on the molecular and cellular mechanisms of neurological damage in uh, DM1, and which uh, he has established and managed for the last 15 years. His pioneering work provided key conceptual advances on the implication of synaptic protein dysfunction and real cells in DM1 brain disease. Uh, uh, he has authored more than 25 papers and participates regularly in different meetings and collaborations with academica, academia and in industrial partners. Arno Klein um, has been working on myotonic dystrophy. Yes, he is the guy on the dark shirt. <laughs> and uh, is more generally uh, interested on repeat expansion diseases for nearly 20 years. He, also, he obtained his PhD in molecular biology from the University of Montreal in, in Canada and worked under the supervision of Dr. Uh, Bernard Gray to understand the pathological mechanisms that lead to uh, ocular pharyngeal muscular dystrophy, uh, uh, late onset muscular dystrophy that uh, is consequence of a triplet expansion uh, mutation in the ubiquitous gene and the formation of intranuclear aggregates. When he got back in France, he joined the team of the Nifur Wing as a postdoc and worked on day one. Uh, that is another triplet expansion disease with intranuclear aggregates. 
is now uh, in the team repeated expansions and myoclonic dystrophies that uh, the Nifer Wing and Geneviève Boudron lead uh, within the Centre de Recherche uh, en Biology. Uh, as I said, a partnership that includes Sorbonne University in CERN and the Institute of Myology in Paris. The team has a unique scientific and clinical expertise and uh, uses this combined approach for improving the results of translational research. And Arnaud was able to uh, develop innovative therapeutic approaches for the disease, namely antisense oligomer nucleotides, and he participated also in the development of several uh, DM1 models. Uh, so is also um, has published more than 20 articles on the subject and uh, filed a patent and participates in several collaborations at national and international levels, uh, both with academia and uh, with industrial partners. Uh, thank you uh, for accepting our invitation to present today's webinar and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Antonio, for the introduction, and uh, thank you for the invitation to share some of the latest progress in myotonic dystrophy. And is it okay? Can you see the slides? Perfect. I hope so. Yeah. Okay. So um, thank you again, and um, just double check. So together with. Together with Arnaud, we have decided to put up this presentation that includes three main uh, topics. So first, I will give you a, um, an overview of the genetic aspects of myotonic dystrophy type 1, or DM1 for short. Then we will move on to talk about the pathophysiological mechanisms of the disease, how the mutation explains the symptoms. And, uh, and I will take this chance to give you a flavor of the results that we have recently obtained in the laboratory. And finally, Arnaud will tell you about uh, the latest therapeutic developments that have been proposed for DM1. And so I would like to point out that the strategy or the, the structure of our presentation follows pretty much the timeline of the DM1 research that has been very logical step-by-step from the identification of the gene mutation to the development of the first clinical trials. So DM1 is one of many diseases associated with, the, with unstable DNA sequences, also called DNA microsatellites. And among those, the expansion of trinucleotide repeats is the most common cause of human disease, in which one of these trinucleotide repeat expansion diseases there is one particular trinucleotide repeat that is abnormally expanded in one specific gene. And that will give rise to disease through a mechanism that is specific to that uh, same disorder. In some cases, you have the loss of function of the gene that carries the repeat expansion. This is the case of the fragile X syndrome. In other cases, where the expanded repeat, like the CAG here, is exonic, it will affect and code for an expanded polyglutamine stretch in the final protein that is, that is toxic to the cell and will, will lead to cell dysfunction. But non-coding triplet repeats can also be pathogenic because they will trigger the accumulation of toxic RNA um, molecules in the cell that will have a deleterious effect, as we'll see later. And DM1 is today seen as the prototype of a family of diseases that are mediated through this mechanism or of toxic uh, RNA. So DM1 is an autosomal dominant uh, uh, neuromuscular disorder with a worldwide prevalence that is classically estimated in one in 8,000, but that varies greatly from one region to another. So recently, for instance, there, is a, uh, there has been a study published in uh, the state of New York in the US that has estimated this prevalence as being four times higher. And we knew before that the number can be up to one in 500 in certain regions of Quebec. So this is certainly variable, but DM1 is likely the most prevalent form of neuromuscular disease, at least in adults. 
It is mainly characterized by the degradation of the neuromuscular function, but in fact is a highly uh, variable disease in terms of the distribution, severity, and the age of onset of the symptoms. And it is due to this uh, variability that we can identify five clinical forms of the disease depending on the age of onset of the first symptom. You have the late onset form that is mainly characterized by premature cataracts. The typical adult form that presents the muscle symptoms that, we, uh, that have given the name to the disease, the myotonia and the muscle weakness, but also cardiac problems, the dysfunction of the GI tract, and very subtle but typical neurological manifestations that include executive dysfunction, problems with the uh, spatial memory, as well as lack of motivation and apathy, for instance. In the childhood and juvenile forms of the disease, these neurological symptoms are even more severe and they usually precede the onset of the muscular manifestations. They are characterized by a low IQ, by attention deficits that will most certainly translate into learning problems uh, at school, and they will, and uh, together with low processing speed. And some authors claim that there are some signs of autistic spectrum disorder that in, in this uh, uh, group of patients. Finally, the congenital form of the disease, the most severe form, is present from pregnancy onwards with an excess of amniotic fluid, a reduction of the movements of the embryo, and then after birth, the baby will show general hypotonia together with breathing and feeding problems that will result in a very high perinatal mortality. And those babies that will survive the reanimation that is most likely necessary at this critical period will later develop cognitive and motor deficits. This slide also illustrates uh, the fact that the disease gets more and more severe from one generation to the next, which goes hand in hand with a decrease in the age of onset, something that is very marked, is very pronounced in DM1 and that we call anticipation. DM1 is caused by the expansion of a CTG trinucleotide repeat in the three prime UTR of the DMPK gene that codes for a protein kinase. So a region of this gene that is transcribed, but that is not translated. The DMPK gene uh, has, is expressed in different tissues of the body and plays different functions in the cell. But it does not seem to be essential because we know today that mice that are knocked out for the DMPK gene, they do pretty well and they may present some very mild phenotypes at later uh, stages. While healthy people have between five and 37 repeats, patients have more than 50 CTGs up to a few thousands in the most severe cases of the disease. And in fact, there is a good correlation between the inherited CTG repeat size and the clinical manifestations of the disease. The larger repeats here are associated with the more severe form of the disease, sorry, with more severe form of the disease that, uh, and, uh, and earlier uh, manifestations. Nevertheless, there is some overlapping and you can see that for the same inherited repeat size uh, or the same inherited repeat size can be associated with different forms of the disease. So the correlation is good, but it's not perfect. On top of being pathogenic, the expanded triplet repeat is also extremely unstable with a very marked tendency to increase even further in size from one generation to the next, but also in the somatic tissues of a patient. So here in this slide, I show you the intergenerational instability, and you can see that the repeat increases through three successive generations. And because longer repeats are associated with the more severe form of disease, the intergenerational instability explains the phenomenon of anticipation and the aggravation of the symptoms from a late onset form in the grandmother here on the left to the congenital form in the baby here uh, or, or the child here at the front that has already inherited more than 2000 CTG repeats. Interestingly, these congenital cases are almost exclusively transmitted from the mothers. Uh, which introduces a factor related to the sex of the transmitting father in this intergenerational instability that we cannot fully explain today. But the repeat is also unstable in somatic cells. 
And here I show you the, the analysis of the CTG repeat size in the blood of a DM1 patient by a PCR uh, technique. So in this, in each well of this uh, uh, gel, you have the amplification of an average of 40 uh, uh, molecules of DNA or genomes uh, by PCR. And you can see that the repeat sizes cluster into two different groups. The short repeats that are present in the non-expanded gene that was inherited from the non-affected parent, and that give rise to a sharp, well-defined band that in this case contained 13 CTG repeats. But in contrast, the expanded repeat present in the mutant gene does not give rise to a sharp, well-defined band, but instead to a mixture of bands that you can see here that represent a variability in the repeat size that we call somatic mosaicism. That goes in this case from a lower repeat size of about 100 CTG repeats up to nearly 400 CTG repeats in some uh, alleles. So this uh, somatic instability is clearly expansion biased, as you can see, it tends to increase in size and it is also tissue specific because if you do the same analysis in the skeletal muscle of the same individual, you detect again this very high somatic mosaicism, but in this tissue, the, re the repeat can accumulate up to 700 CTGs in contrast with the, with the blood. And so today we believe that uh, the tissues where the repeat tends to accumulate repeat, larger repeat sizes will present more severe symptoms. This is the case of the skeletal muscle in DM1. So if the repeat is somehow toxic to the cell, it is somehow logical again that the repeat that accumulate the longer, the, the, the tissue, sorry, that accumulate the longer repeat will have, the, will suffer from the most deleterious effect of the mutation. The dynamics of these repeats is such that they will continue to uh, increase in size during the, throughout the life of a patient. Again, I show you the analysis in the blood of the same patient at, uh, sampled at 18 and 20 years of age. And you can see that over this short period of time, the average repeat size of the expanded repeat moved from 600 CTGs at 18 up to, up to 700 CTGs two years later. And over the same period, the non-expanded uh, uh, repeat remained pretty stable without any signs of expansions. So in conclusion for this uh, first part, we can uh, say that the repeat, the CTG repeat is extremely unstable from one generation to the next, which explains the phenomenon of anticipation and the aggravation of the disease from parent to child, but it is also unstable in somatic tissues with a pattern that is expansion biased and that changes from one tissue to another. And it seems to be more pronounced in tissues that are more severely affected by the disease. So this tissue specific somatic instability may contribute to the phenotypic distribution of the clinical manifestations of the disease. But it is also dependent on age and, it, and there is a, a, a greater accumulation of longer repeats as the patients get older, which may contribute to the aggravation of the symptoms in older individuals. So following the identification of the disease mutation in DM1, the research objectives uh, or, or, the, or, or the research has shifted from the genetic aspects to the pathophysiological mechanisms of the disease. The idea was that if we are able to understand the sequence of events that connect the mutation to the onset of the symptoms, we will be able to maybe slow, to slow down or even stop critical events that uh, will lead to disease. And this will may en enable us to uh, slow down or even avoid the, the, the disease onset in individuals that carry the mutation or even cure the disease in individuals that are already uh, symptomatic. So to do this kind of research, it is extremely important to recreate the disease in the laboratory because the access to human samples is not always easy. And so it is for that reason that animal models of DM1 became very popular and extremely helpful in our research. But how can then a non-coding CTG repeat that does not affect the final protein encoded by this gene 
lead to such a severe and multi-systemic disease that affects so many tissues and organs in the body. So we were able to better understand the, uh, the DM1 molecular mechanisms after the mapping of another mutation that causes myotonic dystrophy type 2. So what is myotonic dystrophy type 2? So following the identification of the CTG repeat in the DNPK gene, it became clear that there was a group of patients that presented very similar clinical symptoms, but who did not carry the CTG repeat expansion in the DMPK gene on chromosome 19. So that's why we call this disease DM type 2. And it was in 2001 that uh, the mutation was found, and it is a the expansion of another DNA repeat, but this time is a CCTG tetranucleotide that maps within the first intron of the CNBP gene that codes for a transcriptional factor that has no functional correlation with the DMPK gene. So what do these diseases have in common? The fact that the DMPK RNA containing the CUG expansions in DM1 and the CNBP RNA containing the CCUG expansions in DM2 accumulate in the nucleus of the cells. They are not exported towards the cytoplasm where they should be translated into protein. Instead, they accumulate uh, in the nucleus of the cells, forming these aggregates or RNA foci that you can see here labeled in green for DM1 and in pink for uh, DM2. So this was the first evidence that there is some sort of abnormal processing of the RNA in the two conditions, and that these RNAs may, must have some sort of deleterious effect to the cell. So to show that these are, that, that um, repeat containing RNAs were indeed toxic to the cells, the lab of Charles Thornton in the US has created a mouse model that is still uh, used today in many studies, as we'll see later. Uh, and in these mice, they have introduced a CUG repeat expansion in the three prime UTR of another unrelated gene, the, uh, the skeletal actin gene that is specifically expressed in the skeletal muscle of these mice. So when this uh, transcript is expressed, it uh, um, these mice show signs of myopathy with the accumulation of RNA for psi here that you can see in fluorescent green. And most importantly, they also show uh, myotonia. And you can see here the myotonia of the hind legs of this transgenic mouse in this video. You can clearly see that the, the, the muscles of the hind legs are contracted, a sign of myotonia. So this experiment clearly demonstrated that the CUG repeats can be toxic independently of the genetic context where they are inserted, as long as they are expressed and they accumulate in the nucleus of the cell. So here in Paris, we have decided to uh, study the RNA toxicity in other tissues of the, of the mice. And for that reason, we have generated another complementary mouse model that expresses a human DNPK transgene under the control of its own promoter. Uh, and this transgene contains more than 1,000 CTG repeats. The uh, homozygous mice uh, carrying the transgene express enough levels of toxic RNA to present a multi-systemic phenotype that includes high mortality, growth retardation, a decrease in muscle strength that is associated with the disorganization of the end plate of the neuromuscular junction, as well as some cardiac conduction effects and behavioral phenotypes. But the question still remains, how do these toxic, uh, how do these uh, uh, repeat containing RNA molecules are toxic to the cell. Why are they toxic to the cell? Because when they accumulate in the nucleus of DM1 and DM2 cells, they perturb the function of important RNA binding proteins. In particular, they will sequester and trap MBNL proteins that you can see perfectly co-localized with the RNA aggregates in the nucleus of the cell here labeled in blue. You can see there's a perfect co-localization. And from this co-localization, there is a partial inactivation of this protein that although present in the cell, is no longer available to perform the function that, that it usually does in the cell. And in parallel, it has been suggested that CUGBP protein that is also called self one is, is overexpressed at least in DM1. So from these two changes, uh, in these two antagonistic regulators of alternative splicing, we have a lack of functional MBNL that is certainly a major contributor 
for DM1 pathology, but also an overexpression of, uh, of self proteins. And because they both regulate alternative splicing, we will induce a dysregulation of the alternative splicing of transcripts that are under the regulation of these two families of proteins. So from the expression of a toxic RNA in DM1 and also in DM2, we will perturb the function of important uh, RNA binding proteins that will affect many targets downstream, the, uh, downstream, many targets downstream, and therefore induce a spliceopathy in different tissues, such as the muscle, the heart, and the brain. But are these splicing effects the cause of some of these symptoms? Again, to answer this question, we have made use of transgenic animals. So in the mouse that I previously mentioned, and also in DM1 and DM2 patients, the, uh, the chloride channel that is expressed in the skeletal muscle shows the abnormal inclusion of this exon 7A. This embryonic exon should not be present in the adult transcripts because it introduces a premature stope codon that will target the transcript to nonsense mediated decay and that will decrease the levels of the protein in the muscle, which is associated with myotonia. But is this the cause of myotonia? To answer this question, uh, Charles Thornton's lab has uh, manipulated the, the, the splicing uh, of these transcript in the, in, the, in the same mouse model by the injection of antisense nucleotides to force the exclusion of exon 7A to reestablish the reading frame of the transcript and to force the production of the full length protein. And this was sufficient to correct the myotonia of these mice. So this was the demonstration that this splicing event is critical uh, for, or this splicing defect in DM1 is critical for the onset of myotonia. And in the meantime, other splicing effects, such as this uh, calcium channel in the, in, in the muscle as well, the insulin receptor, and also the sodium channel in the heart have been associated with important uh, symptoms that in DM1. Again, contributing to the multi-systemic nature of the disease. So there was a time when we thought that everything was due to spliceopathy, but we know today that mDNA proteins as well as cell proteins are involved in other aspects of the RNA metabolism in, in the cell. And today we know that uh, DM1 is also characterized by problems with transcription, translation, the metabolism of microRNAs, the localization of, of RNA uh, transcripts within the cell, and also alternative polyadenylation. So there is a global um, uh, problems in the processing of the RNA within the cell. So in the lab, we use animal and cell models of DM1 to study three main questions. We are still interesting, interested in uh, dissecting further the mechanisms of repeat instability with the aim of finding means to induce repeat contractions that we predict would be curative. We are also interested in understanding the molecular mechanisms of the disease operating in the muscle, in the brain, and also in the congenital form of the disease. And finally, we are, of course, very much uh, keen in developing new therapeutic approaches for DM1. So I will give you a, a quick overview of the research that we conduct in the lab that uh, on the neurological aspects of the disease. So as I told you before, DM1 is also a, a brain disease that is characterized by cognitive impairment and personality disorders. And uh, this is, of course, corroborated by histopathological changes, by imaging studies, and by molecular abnormalities in human brain tissue. But although we have progressed in the understanding of the disease mechanisms in the muscle and heart, at least, we still don't know how to establish the mechanistic link between the repeat expansion and the onset of the neurological manifestations of the disease. In particular, we do not know the cell types and the pathways that are primarily affected in the brain, and that could offer uh, windows of therapeutic intervention. So to address this question, we have been using, again, our DM SuperXL mice that express the toxic DMPK transcripts in all regions of the CNS that we have studied so far, accumulating RNA for side that you can see here in red, with some regional distributions, uh, the, um, with, with a regional pattern of distribution. These foci seem to be particular 
particularly abundant in the cortical, uh, in the cortical areas of the brain, in the hippocampus, and in some uh, confined areas of the brainstem, for instance. Aranifocytes accumulate in neurons, astrocytes, and oligodendrocytes, at least, and they co-localize with MBNL1 and MBNL2, as you can see here. So this accumulation of foci in different cell types was perhaps the first evidence that uh, DN1 brain pathology does not uh, affect only neurons, but it may involve also non-neuronal cells such as astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. And so um, to study the consequences of the RNA toxicity in the brain of these mice, we have performed a phenotypic characterization of this uh, line, of this line. And we were surprised by one particular finding um, that uh, was in the runaway task, the, the mice are forced to move along uh, a, a runway, a bar, an elevated bar that contains some obstacles that it must overcome to move forward. And we count the number of slips of the hind leg during this task. And we noticed that the DM SuperXL mice here in dark blue have a consistently higher number of slips in comparison to the wild type over five consecutive days, a sign of motor incoordination. That is usually dependent on the function of the cerebellum. But the cerebellum is not typically associated with DM1 brain pathology. So to look into uh, the mechanisms behind this, into the physiology behind this, we have recorded the activity of the Purkinje cells in the cerebellum of our DM SuperXL mice, and we found a abnormal um, hyperactivity that is translated or, or that is illustrated by these uh, higher firing rates of the Purkinje cells. And when we looked into the mechanisms, into the molecular mechanisms behind these, these, these phenotypes, uh, of course, we started by looking uh, into the accumulation of the RNA in the cerebellum of these mice. And we were surprised that we did not find many RNA foci in the Purkinje cells themselves, but in a population of cells that are around, that are located around the Purkinje cells that we have identified as the Bergman glia, which is a type of astrocytes that um, surrounds the Purkinje cells and that creates a proper synaptic environment that will promote effective synaptic transmission. So we then performed a, a proteomics analysis to identify the intermediates that could be perturbed in the cerebellum of these animals and we found a, a significant down regulation of the GLT-1 glutamate transporter in the cerebellum, as you can see. So this transporter is expressed by the astrocytes, including the Bergman glia, and it, and, and it is responsible by the reuptake of glutamate at the end of the, synaptic, uh, of, the, uh, of the transmission of the synaptic signal to avoid an excessive accumulation of glutamate in the synapse and a hyperstimulation of the postsynaptic neuron. But is this defect the cause of the cerebellum phenotype? So to uh, address this question, we have injected DMs for cell mice with an activator of GLT-1 uh, expression that corrected the GLT-1 levels in the cerebellum. And this was sufficient to reduce the higher firing rate of the DM super XL mice back to uh, normal levels as seen in wild type animals and importantly also corrected the number of the slips of the hind leg in the runaway test here in blue after treatment compared to the mice injected with PBS in red. So this was uh, evidence that not only a population of astrocytes has some contribution to the brain phenotypes in our mouse model and in DM1, but also that there, there might be means of therapeutic intervention based on the pharmacological modulation of neurotransmission. So to get further insight into the contribution of different brain cell types, we have used the uh, DM SuperXL mice as a renewable source of different types of brain cells, neurons, astrocytes, and oligodendrocytes, that we first characterize in culture, then we look for signs of toxic RNA accumulation and misplacing, and then through transcriptomics and proteomics uh, approaches, we look for the intermediates and pathways that might be dis, uh, dysfunctional and that might explain the phenotypes that we have previously characterized. 
So this study, uh, this approach allowed us to, to find that astrocytes were the cell type in the brain that showed the most uh, uh, abundant accumulation of RNA foci, which as you can see here, the quantification here on the left, which goes together with a more severe splicing, spliceopathy in comparison to neurons, primary neurons, I should say, primary neurons and oligodendroglia in culture. Interestingly, the transcripts that are mispliced in astrocytes affect primarily cell adhesion, cytoskeleton, and dynamics of the plasma membrane. And the defect that we see in, uh, the, in, the, in the astrocytes of our mouse model recreate the splicing profile of immature astrocytes. Let's focus here on SORPS1, for instance. You see that the astrocytes from our transgenic animals have a abnormal exclusion of exon 27, while this exon is included in the astrocytes from wild type controls. This profile with the exclusion of exon 27 is the same one that we see in immature astrocytes in the mice. So there is some sort of impairment of the molecular program of differentiation of glial cells uh, in our mouse model. So how does this uh, affect the, the mice in, the, in vivo or the astrocytes in vivo? First, we looked at the density of astrocytes in our uh, animals and there was no difference. Then we looked at the morphology of the astrocytes and we saw that the astrocytes in DM supercell mice were, uh, were less ramified in comparison to controls, a phenotype that we saw at one month of age, but that was already, that, but, but that was not detected in younger animals and was aggravated in older animals. And how can this affect the brain function? Well, maybe because it affects the neuronal uh, physiology or the neuronal differentiation. And when we uh, uh, established co-cultures of neurons together with astrocytes mixing different genotypes, we found that in the presence of DM superexcel astrocytes, the neurons, the, uh, the, 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 the neurons revealed slow down neurotogenesis. Oops, sorry. As you can see here for wild type neurons and DM super XL neurons. So the presence of astrocytes has a negative impact in the development of neurites, uh, at least in cold culture. So to conclude, using a mouse model of DM1 uh, that presents relevant uh, phenotypes in the central nervous system, we have found the accumulation of toxic RNAs in different cell types that seems to be more pronounced in astrocytes, affecting the morphology of these cells and possibly the differentiation of this cell type. And because astrocytes are so important for the maintaining the structure and the ion and neurotransmitter homeostasis in the synapse, our hypothesis today is that the astrocyte hypertrophy that we see in DM1 uh, uh, may uh, interfere with the efficacy of the synaptic transmission and contribute to the neurological manifestations of the disease. And having said that, so it is important that in the future, the therapeutic strategies that are developed for DM1 tackle not only the neurons in the CNS, but also other cell types, including the astrocytes and possibly oligodendrocytes as well, that might be uh, involved in the myelin defects that have been recently described. And uh, I will now turn the floor to Arnaud. Yeah. Thank you, so, uh, hi everyone. So, uh, I'm going to present you the main theoretical approach uh, developed for uh, this uh, DM1. For DM1, so the main targets uh, of the therapeutic approach are, of course, the mutation at the DNA level that we can interfere with with the genome editing. Uh, the, we can also inhibit the transcription of the mutated transcript, the NPK transcript. Uh, we can target the mutated transcript directly, or the, uh, we can target the MDNL1 or self one protein to modulate their uh, expression. Or in the end, we can also uh, try to correct the molecular or the cellular defect individually, like, for example, the myotonia. Over the years, uh, all these strategies have been developed and uh, evaluated, but most of them uh, aim to uh, target the DNA mutation or the uh, mutated transcript and its uh, deleterious uh, binding of mdna one 
So for the genome editing, we uh, can use challenge protein, uh, zinc figure protein, or the CRISPR-Cas system against the DMPK gene, or uh, most uh, specifically the CTG repeats. Uh, one strategy is to cut at each side of the repeat to remove the repeats, or we can uh, cut within the repeats to reduce the size of the repeats. Another strategy is to cut in front of the repeat and insert uh, polyadenylation signals to generate smaller trans uh, DMPK transcripts, but uh, without the CTG repeats. All of these approach have been evaluated in uh, cells models, and some of them have made the proof of concept in a mouse model with uh, very promising results. For uh, the strategies aiming uh, targeting the DMPK transcript or the levels of NBNL1, there are several uh, approaches uh, for this, uh, this uh, strategy. All of them aim to increase the level of uh, endogenous NBNL1. So we can directly target uh, the mutated transcript to release NBNL1. We can also uh, use a steric blocking to avoid the binding of MBNL on the repeats or to remove MBNL from the repeats, or we can directly increase the levels of MBNL1, all of this approach leading to the correction of the molecular defect. What are the tools for this uh, approach? For the, for the degradation of the transcript, we can use the, the CRISPR-Cas system with the dead Cas9 conjugated to a nuclease, or we can use the Cas13 uh, protein to target the repeats. We can use also antisense oligonucleotides, GAPMER ol oligonucleotides, which uh, can degrade a, a specific transcript using uh, RNAZH mechanism, or we can use uh, ribosine. For the steric blocking at the level of the CUG repeats, we can use once again the CRISPR-Cas system with dead Cas9, or we can use a small nuclear RNA, like the U7 with a CAG antisense sequence, or we can uh, use uh, other uh, RNA binding protein, such as a modified mbna one protein, a project that I will talk later in the presentation. We can use antisense oligonucleotides to target directly the CUG repeat. Also, I will talk about project uh, with this uh, technique uh, later in the presentation. Or we can use small molecules designed to directly target the repeats or to, uh, or to uh, decrease the deleterious binding of MBNL1 to the repeats. For the increase of MBNL1, we can use a, a direct overexpression of MBNL1 using a, a viral vector, but we have to be careful about the level of overexpression and the isoform which is expressed because uh, as, you, as you may know, MBNL1 uh, has more than 10 isoform with different localization and function. Um, we can also increase the level of endogenous MBNL1, for example, uh, using the antagomir or blockmir system to modify its expression, or to use, or to use small molecules or drugs, like in a, a repositioning a st a strategy to increase the levels of MBNL1 with more general pathways. To date, the more advanced uh, strategy is the one published in 2012 by the lab of Charles Santon. It's a GAPMER strategy. Uh, which induced the degradation of the mutated transcripts. You can see they made the proof of concept, sorry, uh, in the HSA-LR mice, so the M1 mice model Mario presented to you uh, earlier. You can see that in the treated mice, sorry, we have a nice degradation of the mutated transcript in several muscles, you can see here. And among the all the correction observed in the treated mice, uh, functional and molecular, we have also a normalization of the transcriptome in the treated mice. This study was followed by a clinical trial uh, led by uh, the company Ionis with their compound uh, DMPK Rx. So it was a phase one, two A tra clinical trial uh, with more than 36 patients in the US. Uh, they tried uh, four increasing doses uh, with a systemic treatment. And as it was a phase one, two A trial, they looked at the safety, the tolerability, and the efficiency of their uh, compound. Uh, the results 
uh, the results were in the 2017, and they showed that the product was well uh, to, uh, tolerated uh, by patients, but there was very mild to no efficiency in the skeletal muscles, and they conclude that the product did not achieve the needed concentration uh, to have an effect in the muscles. So uh, at the end of the presentation, I will show you a table of uh, more uh, therapeutic approaches developed in the preclinical uh, trial or at even at the clinical trial. But now I will present you two studies uh, developed by, developed by uh, our lab uh, in the recent years. So in the first one is the use of antisense oligonucleotide to directly target the repeats. And in the second one, it's the use of a modified MBNL1 uh, with a viral vector to uh, remove MBNL1 from the repeat. So the first study, as I told you, it's, uh, it's a, a, a oli antisense oligonucleotide uh, strategy using a PMO oligonucleotide, so morpholino uh, chemistry, with an antisense CAG uh, sequence targeting directly the CUG repeats. And the main originality of this uh, approach was, to, uh, was that the oligonucleotide is conjugated to a cell penetrating peptide, the PIPSIS A, uh, developed by our collaborator Matthew Wood in the UK. And uh, the presence of this peptide increased the tissue uptake, uptake of the oligonucleotide. So we first uh, optimized the dose and the injection protocol, uh, but I would not talk about that. But you can see that when we treat uh, our mice, HSL and mice, we first, we can observe that if the non-treated uh, HSL and mice were able to reproduce the splicing defect observed in patients uh, when compared uh, to wild type mice here. And when we treat this HSL and mice with our PIP6A PMO CAG, at a dose of 12.5 milligrams per kilo, and we sacrifice two weeks, the mice two weeks after, we have a complete correction of the splicing defect here for the uh, chloride channel CLCN1. We looked at other transcript, la, uh, observed uh, other uh, splicing misregulation, also observed in the among patients. And you can see that in HSL mice, we reproduce the same uh, splicing changes. And when we treat the mice, we observe also a complete correction of displacing defect, meaning that the treatment with uh, the PIPCC PMO leads to a complete correction of the splicing defect in the skeletal muscle of this mass. As I told you, the main uh, originality of these studies was the use of the PIPCC-A uh, cell penetrating peptide. So we wanted to confirm uh, the beneficial effect of this peptide. So we injected uh, unconjugated PMO uh, sequence, uh, CAG sequence in our mice at a very high dose, 200 uh, milligrams per kilo. And you can see that there's no effect, uh, no correction of the splicing defect when uh, there is no uh, peptide, PIPCC peptide, meaning that the PIPCC peptide is really essential to improve the penetration of our uh, compound. Uh, as Mario uh, presented earlier, this HSR and our mice uh, present some uh, myotonia that uh, you can see in these pictures, and we are able to uh, uh, quantify uh, this phenomenon by measuring the relaxation time. So in the HSL and mice, as uh, it was presented, you can see that there's a muscle contraction uh, after, uh, well, there's a problem in the relaxation of the muscle after the contraction. And in the treated mice, in the treated mice, we are not able to see this myotonia anymore. So we completely corrected the myotonia, and here we have the quantification of the relaxation time after the contraction, and you can see that we have a complete correction of this uh, symptom. Next, we wanted to make sure that the, the, the splicing uh, correction we observed was not only uh, for a few uh, transcripts, but we have a global uh, correction. So we performed uh, RNA sequencing, sequencing analysis, of the alternative splicing events. And you can see here that we have a nice uh, changes in the HSR LR mice compared to the wild type mice. And when we treat the mice with the PIPSIS APMO, we have a global correction of the splicing events, uh, deregulation in the muscles of these treated mice with more than 80% of the splicing, deregulated splicing events, which are corrected uh, with the treatment. And of course, 
uh, all the biological pathways which were deregulated in the HSL LR mice compared to wild type are also uh, completely corrected. Next, we wanted to look at the muscle structure and the fossae formation and the NL1 sequestration. You can see here that in the treated muscle, we have a nice decrease in the number of nuclei with foci. You can see here, and we quantify it here. So there is less sequestered MBNL1 in the treated muscles. And this decrease is also associated with a decrease in the level of the mutated transcript, uh, as, you can see, as you can see here. It's, which is quite surprising because our PMO sequence is not designed to uh, directly degrade the mutated transcript, but our uh, hypothesis is that with the presence of the ASO, we have a release of, MD, of MBNL1 and the export of the mutated transcript, which is not sequestered anymore, and, and uh, then the transcript is processed by the cellular machinery. Next, we wanted to confirm that our compound was efficient in the human context. So we tested in our cell models. So we use a human immortalized myoblast derived from a patient with more than 2,000 repeats. These cells showed a typical DM1 features such as the formation of foci, intranuclear foci, which colocalized with MBNL1 and uh, uh, the cells also present uh, deregulation of splicing defect, specific of DM1. And the cells also uh, show some uh, myogenic differentiation defect. So we treated ourselves with the PIPSIS A PMO, and you can observe here that we have a nice uh, decrease in the number of foci per nuclei, which is quantified here. Uh, this decrease is associated with a decrease in the level of the mutated transcript, uh, you can see here by northern blood. And also, we have a nice correction of the splicing defect observed in these uh, cells. So altogether, uh, uh, the PIPSIS APMO uh, allowed to uh, the correction of the molecular and functional symptom in DM1 models. Now, I will present you another study that uh, our lab uh, recently published about a gen uh, therapy approach using a viral vector. So it uh, was antivirus for cell models and AIV for mice models. So we use uh, RNA binding protein and we took benefit of uh, the affinity of MDNL1 for the repeat. So we generated a truncated MDNL1 that I will call uh, MDNL1 delta, which keeps its high affinity for the DMPK mRNA or the repeat uh, for the YGC-wide sequences, but we remove the splicing activity. So first, we uh, transduced uh, our cell models with the, our uh, construct, and uh, it was uh, with an inducible promoter. So you can see here that when we uh, induce the expression of our construct, we have a nice uh, increase in the, of our compound uh, quickly after the, uh, the induction. And expression of our construct lead to a complete correction of the splicing defect observed in these cells. Then uh, we performed also an RNA sequencing analysis, and we saw that more than 70% of the deregulated splicing events were co corrected or partially corrected in the treated cells. Next, we looked at the foci and the number of foci. You can see here that we have a nice decrease in the number of foci per nuclei in uh, uh, the treated cells. And the quantification here, you can see that this uh, decrease uh, arrived quite quickly after the induction of, uh, after the expression of our uh, therapeutic tool. So meaning that the expression of the therapeutic mbn one beta and choose the correction of the molecular defect observed in DM1 cells. Next, we wanted to test the efficiency of our compound in the mice model, but first we uh, tested it in wild type mice to make sure that uh, it did not induce deleterious effect, especially on splicing and uh, wild type muscle. So we use uh, intramuscular injection with the AEV, uh, CMV, and the NL1 delta, and we sacrifice the mice after seven weeks. As you can see here, sorry, as you can see here, Expression of our mbn one delta did not induce changes, uh, deleterious changes in the muscles uh, of the treated mice, which is not the case with the full length mbn one uh, overexpression. Oh, sorry. Uh, 
expression of our tool did not change the level of the endogenous MBNL1, as you can see here, and did not, uh, did not induce uh, changes in the splicing uh, regulation, as you can see here in this graph, uh, which is the uh, splicing index, uh, which, which is, is uh, the average uh, analysis of more than the 15 transcripts. So next, we tested our compound in uh, our construct in the uh, HSA Alabice. It was the same protocol, intramuscular injection, and sacrificed after seven weeks. You can see here that our compound uh, is uh, well localized in the foci. Its expression of the compound lead to the correction of the splicing defect of more than 60%, and the correction of the myotonia and also a decrease in the level of the mutated transcript, meaning that expression of the MDNA1 data induced the correction of the molecular and functional defects in the muscles of the HSA and mice. To, uh, con to conclude with the uh, in vivo study, we wanted to uh, confirm uh, the long-term expression of our uh, therapeutic tool and the long-term effect of this tool, and uh, we made intramuscular injection and we sacrificed the mast after 12 months. And you can see that after a year, we have still a strong and almost complete correction of the splicing defect observed in the treated mice. Also a complete correction of the myotonia and also the correction of other uh, histological features as, which are specific to GM1, meaning the uh, number of uh, fibers with un uh, internalized uh, nuclei which is a typical feature of a DM1 in observing DM1 patients. So we have a, a long-lasting therapeutic effect of MDNA1 data in the treated muscles of HSL and mice. So uh, to conclude, we well, presented you two therapeutic approaches for DM1, one with an uh, antisense oligonucleotide targeting the COG repeats, and another one, which is a gene therapy uh, approach to delocalize MDNA1. Both approaches induce the correction of the molecular defect in cell models, but also the correction of molecular and functional defects in uh, mice models using a systemic or local injection. Uh, both induce a decrease in the level of the mutated transcripts and have both a long-lasting effect. So to finish, to conclude, um, here a table of uh, some of the uh, approaches, a therapeutic approach currently under development or in preclinical trial or, or in clinical trial. And you can see that um, almost half of them uh, use gen therapy of anti or antisense uh, oligonucleotides, meaning that in, uh, in a few months, uh, months, we will have uh, promising results uh, about uh, uh, for a DM1, for sure. So I would like to thank uh, our team, so the repeat expansion and myotonic dystrophy teams with uh, all the people involved in these uh, studies. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Arno. Thank you, Mario. Uh, very interesting uh, scanning review of what's going on in terms of pipelines for treatment of the myotonic dystrophy type one. And uh, although we have very distinguished experts in the list of participants. For the moment, they haven't started putting their questions. So as usual, I will be the annoying guy that will start, if you don't mind too much. Okay. And uh, probably I will leave more uh, other questions to the participants. And I would start by something that I'm interested that is the cerebellar function uh, alterations that Mario has, um, has talked about. In fact, uh, some years ago, I was involved in a paper. In fact, one of the, par of the participants of this session is also involved, Nikoveta Nikovenko, uh, in a paper that described the usefulness of a, a scale to assess a toxic patients, the SARA scale, uh, in myotonic dystrophy type 1 patients. 
And so uh, it's no surprise that uh, you have also found obvious alterations uh, in the mice models that you have developed. My interesting about this is that it is two, two questions. One is, is there any perspective that uh, down regulation, <coughs> I'm sorry, of GLT-1 could be ever tried in humans in the near future? And uh, the other thing that I wanted to ask is uh, I suppose that uh, the problems with uh, walking in these patients are as usual a bit multifactorial and besides the impairment of the cerebellar uh, coordination and adaptation movements we have to account for things like uh, uh, lack of attention, sleepiness during the day, and whatever else may be a problem. But uh, basically, Mario, GLT-1 could be a target or not in humans, and... Uh, um... I'll, I'll, I, will start, yeah. I will start by the second question. So yeah, you're absolutely right. I think that um, the manifestations of a cerebellum dysfunction are probably not only due to cerebellum problems, at least in the tests that we have performed in our mouse model, we cannot exclude the other even neurological problems, as you said, the lack of attention or lack of concentration on sleepiness, and also muscular problems. We know that the, the muscular problems, and in particular the weakness of the calf muscles may, and the ankle may, induce a lack of equilibrium. And there are, in fact, episodes of certain falls by DN patients, but it has been classically attributed to mus muscular weakness. So to, that, to, to address the cerebellar, more, uh, cerebellar function more uh, precisely, there are other possibilities in mice. Um, I mean, we're not a cerebellum uh, specialist lab, but there are other specialized tests that can assess the cerebellar function in mice, like the, I don't know, it's called, but some sort of ocular reflex that is, you must know it better than me, that is dependent on the cerebellum and does not necessarily involve muscular function. And in humans, we can also estimate, we can also imagine that the cerebellum that has not only, that has more than uh, motor functions, may be involved in many other aspects of the disease. And I think a detailed cognitive uh, assessment of patients may help us move forward. As for GLT-1, um, I'm not, again, uh, this was the proof of concept of two things, this study, that uh, glia were involved in the brain dysfunction and that uh, through a mechanism that then affects the firing of neurons, this is the first interesting result. The second one is that we can correct these defects through a pharmacological approach. Whether or not GLT-1 is the best candidate, I'm not sure. GLT-1, it's going to be difficult to take into the clinic because it's an, um, the, I mean, it, it needs to be a very controlled uh, approach. And in particular, the molecule that we used in our mice, it's, it's going to be difficult to take into the clinic. It's a molecule that is well known to activate GLT-1, but it, it's safe triaxone so it is an antibiotic that has been published many years ago as an activator of GLT-1. I don't think this will be a, 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 a lead for a clinical trial, but we can imagine ways of um, modulating neurotransmission. We are also interesting, interested, and we have some data on the GABA transmission that, that may also be affected. So I think there's a lot to understand, to, to study, before deciding what the best target will be for uh, therapies targeting the CNS. Thank you. Uh, that's interesting. The other thing, and now I would address Arno, and I'm still talking and putting questions because the no one else is putting. So that's my privilege, uh, and I don't mind at all. Uh, uh, so Arno, uh, what I wanted to know is what kind of studies of combined approaches do you know about? Because what I think in certain diseases like FSHD, you never expect just addressing one of the mechanisms of the disease will correct enoughly the, the clinical phenotype. And uh, uh, I'm not saying that is necessarily the case in the M1, but uh, uh, 
it would be intuitive that if you could at the same time reduce the number of repeats and uh, uh, increase the availability of MBL one uh, it could have some uh, synergetic uh, effects. So uh, do you know of anything like this or is this just uh, oh. a wish idea? Uh, to my knowledge, now there is no uh, uh, combination of uh, therapeutic approach because we still don't know what uh, what we can expect from uh, a, a specific uh, targeted uh, therapy, meaning that we have no results on the patients of uh, for the use of oligonucleotides or uh, gen therapy. So I think it's uh, a, a little bit too uh, early to uh, to uh, to talk about uh, uh, um, to use uh, of many well, to, to use many uh, different uh, approach at the same time but um, of course we can we can think about uh, uh, genome, genome editing if uh, if it's not complete uh, to uh, to use uh, other uh, like uh, oligonucleotide antisense uh, strategy to complete to uh, to complete the the correction, but at this time I think it's too early to uh, to think about that. Okay, so as the audience skips the silence, and we are now a bit over the time, I'm going to thank you both for this uh, very interesting and. Uh, um, expectation raising uh, talk because uh, we need to basically manage these clinical uh, problems and you have basically the light that goes ahead so that we may in the future have ways of uh, improving our patient's care. So thank you very much to both, and I, I'm I'm sure we'll meet very soon in this. In the... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. maybe. Bye bye. Thank bye. you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. bye.